Attention listeners, ahead are spoilers. Hello and welcome to the Movie Trap. My name is Russell Carlson and with me is my partners and co-host, one being Chris Boroff. It was a war, Connie. <laughs> but they were the good times, George. Uh, and join me as well, my partner and co-host, Zach Bowers. Uh, Santa Lennon, I guess. <laughs> It's the second best secret agent in the whole wide world. Uh, welcome to the movie trap, everybody. Uh, on the movie trap, one of the hosts you just met picks a theme, and then each of the other hosts picks a movie based on that theme, and we all watch them. After we've watched all three movies, we then vote with an allocated amount of points, plus some bonus points we earn along the way, uh, and we vote for whichever movie was our favorite or fit within the theme, whatever we want. Um, and then whichever movie wins the vote, that host gets to pick the next theme. Uh, I made sure to do that detail because that is exactly what's happening at the end of this episode. We will vote with our points uh, for the next episode because we are wrapping up Zach Powers' theme of adaptations that we ourselves have actually read. Uh, we opened with uh, Shawshank Redemption, hint, hint, the clear winner. Uh, with uh, then we went with Chris Boroff's Pontypool, and now here we arrive at my pick for this, which is Jean Le Carre's classic, uh, which is a 2011 movie, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Um, that is what we are here to do today. Uh, so yeah, tune in for the voting when we get there. We're gonna pick a brand new theme, it's gonna be awesome. Uh, so before I let Zach loose and let him run his networks and agents in the field. Let me get a rundown of the points of where we stand currently. Uh, Chris Borath, you have 13 points for final voting right now with one more bonus point to give out. Uh, I have 11 points for final voting with one bonus point to give out. And Zach Powers, you have 11 points with two bonus points to give out. Uh, and that is where we are standing. So, uh, gentlemen, it's uh, great to be back and uh, yeah, finally get to wrap up this theme. Uh, so yeah, uh, with that in mind, Zach, take her away. Uh, yeah, so Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy 2011 uh, sort of spy thriller uh, based on a Jean Le Carre book directed by Thomas Alfredson of uh, Let the Right One In and The Less Esteemed The Snowman. Um <laughs> Uh, it stars, uh, you know, Gary Oldman, Colin Firth, Tom Hardy, John Hurt, Mark Strong, Benedict Cumberbatch, Toby Jones, a whole bunch of people. Um, and essentially, it takes place in the early 1970s uh, in the world of British Cold War intelligence called The Circus in this film. Um, it opens with uh, Mark Strong's character, uh, Jim Prideaux. In Budapest, uh, having a meet with a general there, uh, looking for the name of a mole in British intelligence. Something goes wrong, and Purdue is shot in the back while trying to escape the meet up. Uh, this causes a shakeup at the circus where Control, the head of uh, the organization, played by John Hurt, uh, and uh, his second in command, George Smiley, Gary Oldman, uh, uh, are made to retire after the whole fiasco. Um, and uh, Control passes away not long after that. Um, Toby Jones' Percy becomes uh, the new um, leader of the circus um, with uh, Colin Firth and uh, a couple of other uh, notable characters, Roy and Toby, and played by a couple of Kiernan Hines and some other guy toby esterhouse, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. toby esterhouse yeah toby esterhouse yeah uh literally his name is bland yeah um uh, as uh other high-ranking officials in the organization um trying to farm soviet intelligence um meanwhile uh the a field agent uh played by tom hardy named ricky tar uh tries to warn that um uh, there is a mole in the circus, uh, echoing sort of what we saw at the beginning. And uh, Control had that same theory, obviously. 
Um, so Smiley is recruited to investigate, even though he had been forced into retirement, with the help of Benedict Cumberbatch's Peter Gillum. Um, uh, so he interviews a few people from the old days, the old uh, Connie Sachs, who's an old secretary uh, before the shakeup. Sophiatologist. It's, Yeah. Yeah, uh, she uh, she worked with the old gang, as it were, and uh, deduced that um, one of their uh, contacts, Alexei Polakov, uh, a Russian who they think is feeding Polyakov. them information. Yeah, uh, is uh, there's a lot of names in this, so it's just going to be like that. Um, for sure. Uh, for sure. Uh, I'm here for you, buddy. Um, uh, might have been uh, a mole himself. There's connections to him that he didn't disclose to other Soviet leaders based on old film reels. And she was forced out of the organization by Percy. Um, so, uh, uh, Tar, um, where am I? Uh, Right. So eventually, Ricky Tar then like meets actually George. You know. Yeah, Tar is discovered alive. Uh, he's been missing for some time. George manages to track him down, um, uh, and he reveals the story of what happened to him. Uh, he was investigating a guy named Boris who turned out to be a dead end, but found out uh, got close with uh, Boris's uh, mistreated wife, who actually did have uh, a secret. Uh, that there was, in fact, a high-ranking defector in uh, in the circus. Um, and eventually, uh, when he tried to wire that information, uh, Irina was uh, abducted. He went into hiding, uh, and his handler and uh, one of Irina's bodyguard's friends were also murdered that same night. Uh, so it was a whole thing immediately after he wired the information to the circus that there may be a spy in their midst um and uh so smiley sends uh gillum to try and find the logbook for the date that tar would have con contacted them um he illegally smuggles it out um and they find that the uh the date in question that the contact would have been made has been torn out it is missing so it looks like someone is in fact covering their tracks um, Tar is painted as a traitor um, and uh, by the people uh, running the circus now. Um, but Smiley believes that the mole is, in fact, just trying to discredit him uh, and pin the blame on him. Um, and in fact, that the traitor is in league with a, a Moscow spymaster named Carla that Smiley met many years ago and uh, gave uh, a lighter. Uh, that his wife gave him previously, um, possibly letting Carla know that his weakness, in fact, was his love of his wife. Um, it's also about this time that we learn Purdue, in fact, did not die. He is now uh, a school teacher in, I think, somewhere in rural England, um, living assumedly under a fake identity. Cornwell or, is where it's supposed to be. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Cornwall. yeah, so in Cornwall and, uh, uh, yeah, so he is still alive and has taken to being a teacher. Uh, he's also taken an affinity to one student in particular who he kind of sort of mentors, uh, it's just kind of a side story a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, Bill Roach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, we also learn that uh, the night of uh, the uh, kerfuffle with uh, the information from Tar coming through, um, uh, that uh, Hayden was there almost immediately somehow. And uh, his reason was he got uh, it on the ticker at his club, but the ticker would have been shut off at that point, at which point uh, uh, Smiley reveals the reason he knew is because they had tried to contact Smiley, they got his wife, and Hayden had been having an affair with Smiley's wife, uh, secretly the entire time. Um, eventually, uh, Smiley manages to track down Purdue, who is still alive, uh, and interview him about what happened to him after the failed mission. 
He was taken in by Soviet agents and tortured for some prolonged period of time, trying to get every shred of information they could out of him. The only thing he held back was that Control uh, was really investigating this top mole in the circus, uh, but he gave up pretty much everything else uh, under torture. Um, Irina, who Tar is desperate to save, it turns out was shot in front of Purdue, um, though Tar is unaware of that fact. Um, <clears throat> so eventually, uh, Smiley deduces sort of what is going on, that uh, Operation Witchcraft is sort of a double cross, that uh, Polaka Polyakov is uh, feeding them... Polyakov. Polyakov is feeding them uh, mostly bad or wrong information with a few good pieces mixed in in an effort to get them to uh, tempt the Americans into trading secrets. Meanwhile, uh, the mole in the operation is sending better intelligence and hopefully eventually American intelligence uh, to the Soviets. Um, so... Uh, Smiley, uh, having sort of uh, figured this out, decides to threaten uh, uh, Esther House, who it turns out uh, is not a native British citizen. He was saved during the war. Um, and he threatens to have him deported uh, in order to obtain more information about this Operation Witchcraft. It turns out that basically Percy, Esther House, um, Bland, all of them, uh, Hayden have all dropped some degree of information uh, off with um, uh, uh, the Russians. Polyakov. Yeah, specifically Polyakov as an intermediary. But the idea was, again, that it was a bit of a double cross, that it was not the most valuable information, and it was more a way to sort of coax uh, him into a, a more comfortable relationship. And that's why he fired... Uh, 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 what's her name? Connie Sachs. Um, because mm -hmm. she was kind of onto the fact that they were to some degree feeding information to the Russians in order to get more information in return. It was sort of a whole cycle. Um, she, she figured out that Polyakov was a, was Carla trained that like Carla has a way of training his spies. And she worked out that this guy's a Carla trained hood. Um, her words anyway. Um, but, uh, at this point, uh, Smiley sends Tar to Paris, uh, a, uh, a spy station in Paris, and uses that him to inform Russian that he has new vital information. He had been disappeared for quite some time. Um, Smiley waits at the safe house location to see uh, who shows up in response to the information. Everyone does, but eventually only one of them um, makes their way to Polyakov, uh to start discussing uh you know uh the cover-up about uh if he has any information and what to do with tar at which point we find that uh hayden is the one who in fact was dropping the real information to polyakov and in turn carla um and he is arrested and uncovered uh percy is removed as the head of control and replaced by george smiley um, at the center where Hayden is being, uh, held, um, Purdue, uh, Sarah. yeah, uh, shoots him in retaliation for the torture he endured. Um, and, uh, you know, Smiley realizes that the affair with his wife was, uh, just a way to keep him uncertain and cloud his judgment because Carla knew that his weak point was indeed his wife. Um, and, uh, Anne eventually does return home, though Anne is never seen in the film except from behind. Um, and, uh, that is, uh, essentially the conclusion of Tinker Tailor's Soldier Spy. You got the gist of it. I would say one kind of major character subplot is that it's heavily implied more so in the movie than in the book. Uh, that Jim Prido and Bill Hayden were lovers, um, that they have a homosexual relationship. Like they, it, it talks all the time how close Bill Hayden and Jim Prido were, but it, it's heavily applied in the movie. And, and the movie does a good job of kind of 
rolling sure, up yeah. all the expo- expo- expository stuff into one single like kind of Christmas party that the circus yeah. is having. So it kind yeah. of unveils all that in a very delicate way. But anyway, yeah, it uh, talks well, about how they were uns- a tough movie to plot out. It talks about how they were inseparable, and uh, he he cries when he shoots uh, Hayden at the end. Yeah, he tells Bill Roach, I've known a lot of Bills, all of them been good, and, you know, like, that's, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, that's that's a tough plot to get through, Zach, so well done, um, because there's not a lot of action <laughs> that actually happens. Yeah, yeah um, um, this but, one, yeah, the car so, novels are, like, kind of... Yeah, the car novels tend to be like that, where there's a lot of plot twists and turns and dialogue heavy and double cross heavy and, you know, politicking and that kind of thing. Yeah, well, and a lot exactly of, a man and a lot of in expository action. information through prose. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. not I, like I, even a, uh, even Spy okay. Who Came From the Cold. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, Boraf. Go. No, no, no. <laughs> uh,. It's okay. I was just, it's funny because like watching it, I remembered liking a lot the first time. I forgot how much of this was just quiet talking in rooms between English people. Like there's not a bunch of like really big action <laughs> moments except for like a couple times when something. And again, that's shot. a pretty, Sean LaCar adaptations. I think that's pretty like, you know, you're going to see the constant gardener or Inspire came into the cold or this. It's going to be a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It makes yeah. sense to me, like, why this was a TV mm. show uh, originally. Indeed, indeed. and But I I, I give this movie a lot of credit uh, for it being basically down to the studs of what the story of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy is, while still carrying with it a lot of heft and it uses it in its source material with a lot of like you know there's a lot of editing tricks that it does to kind of single out you know percy alaline and the three um you yeah know, i think of, there's kind of that whereas in the yeah I, I think there's really good cinematography there's like the way they use certain like images on glass doors to circle characters or the way they shoot uh, signage is always very interesting. There's so much signage in this movie. Um, that's always very mm. clearly in frame and, uh, uh, you know, with varying degrees of, of relevance to the plot, but it is an interesting movie to look at. I think it's uh, the cinematography is, uh, is very uh striking in a lot of the times for a movie because obviously you know and the set design i should say also uh because sure, uh, obviously definitely. yeah this is a movie with a lot of people in rooms talking yeah for sure and that's why i the reason why i even more credit to this movie than i would the 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 miniseries uh is the miniseries came out what like four years after the book came out you know so it was still pretty recent you know like so it it, it i i it, it was probably more entrancing for that audience because they still had the kind of anxieties that we have. Whereas in 2011, with this movie, we don't we don't really have that as much. I mean, not not nearly to the extent that this was. Um, so it kind of allows it to be a little bit more meditative, and it just kind of puts you in the world and the atmosphere of a Le Carre novel without having the total fucking you know massive canon to get through. You know, to kind of really chisel away at the mystery um so i i actually give this movie a ton of credit for for doing that how different is this from the book like i'm assuming the book's just a lot longer has like pretty close it, it's, it's it is it, there's a lot more detail i mean that's that's all i could say really is just it it's it's pretty much they they change a lot with it so there's this scene with um stephen graham where they learn about uh, that Bill Hayden was sleeping with Anne Smiley because he's the one who tried to call George and he wasn't there. That's a character named Jerry Westerby in the uh, in the movie. When in fact it's a guy named Sam Collins. Jerry Westerby is in Tinker Taylor, so but he's a newspaper man. He's he's what the circus would call an occasional. He's not an actual agent. He's just you kind of use him every now and then. He takes he's much more important in the second book. Um, so they kind of change that. They also. 
Uh, that, actually, people- that character is notably played by the guy who played Al Capone in Boardwalk Empire. In yep, this film. Stephen Graham, dude. Fuck yeah. yeah. And um, this is England. He's great. At right. It. This is England. Um, yeah. If, if, uh, they, if they do the honorable schoolboy with him being Jerry Westerby, I'm all for it. Let's go. Um, there was they, uh, uh, apparently anyway. I read like a, a plan for a time to try and make a sequel out of this. Um, the like They're they started writing a uh, script. Uh, theoretically, the idea was to bring back old men. Um, but uh, I think based on what I read in 2021, late 2021, they said uh, that plan is probably not going to happen because now the probably rights to not. all this has reverted back to Lucario's estate because he has died, mm-hmm. uh, died. since mm-hmm. since this movie came out. Um uh and they want to revive uh the some of his novels i think in a television version called like smiley's people or, or something like that um so it the is. the it's plans the for the trilogy yeah the plans for this to have a uh continuing narrative is kind of scrapped it seems like the sequel like a lot of it focuses on um smiley's continue fight against his blowfeld carla um yeah Indeed. Um, so this, it's, it's this one where he never got Carla. a sequel, the, the, right? There's the Carla trilogy. There's no, no. It, but Al, they were there was talks about it that Alfredson wanted to do it, and he was even fine to wait to do it because he wanted Oldman to get older because Smiley gets older. Um, so like he was, but uh, you know, a lot of shit has happened between then and now. Um, you know, so I I get it. Probably not going to happen. And plus, there the BBC. And I, I'll bet you AMC is about to release a, a remake miniseries of the Spy Who Came from the Cold. Uh, Aiden Gillen's going to play the the Burton character, um, and Smiley's in that, not for nothing. Plays a big part mm-hmm. in it, um, so they might spin off of that anyway. They've had some well, success with his other material that are not Smiley related, um, Night Manager and the the Little Drummer Girl, um, notably. So the Lakari is easy to go back to that well. Um, I, I just hope they if they I I always wanted for sure he's his bond he's even yeah, Smi- sure. uh, Lacare even said one time that like even when Smiley's not involved in any of my stories he's like there he says he he kind of moderates me because I'm kind of wild and emotional and he kind of tempers me down that's Smiley's superpower is boredom so if you were bored with this movie he did it um um it, it, it even when you're reading the book when smiley learns a piece of information the prose even goes to say that like smiley then became extremely bored like it's there's this it's the opposite of holmes he holmes gets excited and erratic smiley brings everything down all the time um so it so yeah smiley is his although he's only in 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 the 20 or so books of the carries written he's only in about six or seven um you know, and and in a few of those, even the sequel to the, the immediate sequel to Tinker Taylor, the Honorable Schoolboy, which is the third one in the Carla trilogy, the second one of the Carla trilogy, uh, he's barely in it. It's all Jerry Westerby. He's he's barely in it. There's there's a lot of bureaucratic infighting with the CIA, basically, um, and his continued to help with Carla, where Carla actually has a mole in the Chinese uh, Communist Party, has a similar sort of uh, uh, Gerald Bill Hayden situation in China. Um, so. It's kind of him trying to blackmail and chase Carla the whole time. And the third one, Smiley's People, is where he eventually, spoiler alert, he eventually gets Carla. Um, So, yeah. So, even so, in translating this movie with the book, um, this does a lot of things that I was surprised that it did that I didn't expect it to do. For example, like, you learn, you get the story pretty quickly from Ricky Tarr almost immediately in the book. Like Ricky Tar is the first person you see to tell them about Gerald, um, who's the the Gerald is the co- you're gonna hear me say that a lot. Gerald's the code name that Carla gave Bill Hayden. That's his code name. So Gerald the Mole is all that. He, so he's a myth in Soviet intelligence world that there's this thing called Gerald that's a mole in the circus. So really, the movie is a brilliant adaptation because it takes all of that expository information and crams it to because the movie while still very you know kind of a you know you're dredging through it you know it's only about like an hour 
you know, 40 minutes. It's not that long. So I'm pretty impressed considering that <clears throat> the most successful adaptation of this story was a, a you know, six hour fucking miniseries. Uh, well done. Well done indeed. I should say too, by the way, the, the miniseries starred Alec Guinea, who played George Smiley. Um, and I, as much as I love Gary Oldman, Gary Oldman rocks as George Smiley. I'm for it, but like I still see and feel Guinea in mm. even when I read Smiley books, I I feel Alec Guinea. He just kind of reminds me of him. I don't know. Well, he played um, the character and like right? kind of even agreed. Just twice, Smiley's people and Tinker Taylor. Hmm. Other um, people have played Smiley or versions of Smiley. Sean Connery had to go at it. Uh, um, so, yeah, that's why it, I, I, I give this movie a many, lot of credit. Uh, how, how many other adaptations of this had as many really, really impressive wigs? There were so many wigs in this movie. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Probably not. Uh, this one. Not as many. No, uh, I'm going to give it to this one. Uh, yeah, probably this one. Because like, yeah, like I said, the, the miniseries is only like four years after. So everyone still had relatively the hair, same hairstyle. Yeah, you know? So um, oh, I should also say a big difference that they, a liberty they take in the movie uh, that is not true in the book. They make uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's character, Peter Gillum, gay. Uh, he is very much not gay in, in the in the books um but in a way i understand why they did that because it kind of portends to bill hayden and jim preto so it kind of and it's always fun to do that spies having a double life it's always kind of fun to do that so i i don't have a problem with it any of the changes they did made i i had no problem with but no i wig game it's going to be this one i i think I, I i'm pretty comfortable in saying that yeah mark strong with hair was a little strange to get used to but uh, i eventually got mm, into it yeah for sure for sure mm -hmm. yeah for sure <laughs> even graham right jerry westerby had yeah, that like kind of 70s sort of froish guy and mm -hmm. I, I don't think his hair looks like that but um yeah and, and even, uh, some, uh, character, yeah. like they, you know like yeah right yeah yeah um but i'm glad zach brought up the, the sort of cinematography you know the way that it kind of reveals the, the story through that way. But I was actually impressed with just even the position of the camera. Everything's really far away, which is indicative of also cinematography in the 70s, which I thought was a nice nod. But also, it's a spy novel, right? It's a spy story. So, like, it's meant to be kind of you're, you're, you're prying into something you shouldn't be prying into. You know, it's that voyeuristic shit. Um, like, there's that scene where Ricky Tarr is observing Arena, and it's very much like Rear Window, where you're just, it's, he's far away and, you get everything you need to know with that with just sort of visual, which is cool and groovy. Um, yeah, well done. This is one of my favorite movies of the 2010s, though. I love this movie because uh, I didn't know how they were going to turn this into a two-hour movie, and they did it. So, yeah, fucking well done. Um, yep. That's uh, why I, I think that... Go ahead. I'm more interested because, in, again, I've read the book a couple of times, so, like, I, I'm... I'm pretty jazzed about it. So I'm more interested in your guys' take on it. Did you think it came across? The story was clear? Like, were the 10... Uh, I'm more curious in your guys' opinion of it. Uh, I think the number one thing someone needs to ask themselves before seeing this movie is, like, generally speaking, is Lakara for you? Because, like, I think... If not, this is like, uh, and I think the answer to me to me is like seventy five percent yes, um, but okay. uh, I don't think there's any. Um, I don't think there. I think this is like, uh, and I saw you see it lit, top a lot of lists of like the best, the single best adaptation of his work, um, and I could understand that. I thought it was very engaging. Um, the beginning, like, I was a little bit like, there is too much information going on right now. Like, I think it's a little bit of a miasma, but it eventually, like, you know, I, I started, uh, you know, they told the story well enough that I was like, okay, I understand a little better. They're, they're, they just introduced like 14 different characters with very generic English names. And it's like, I don't know. I, and I know, I knew in my <laughs> mind, I'm like, they're going to refer to these characters when they're off screen all the time. And I'm supposed to remember... They're fucking boring English names. And uh, eventually I was able to do that. But at first it was like, this is this is this is a this is a daunting, confusing sort of task. 
Um, I was in but, the same uh, boat. I, the only thing that saved me was the fact that I was like, okay, it's like every famous English actor working today. So I was able to kind of keep track of at least like, oh, it's that famous guy that I'm seeing again. Facially, I could guy. do it because I recognize yeah. the actors. The problem comes when like they're off screen and they're like, oh, Percy, Roy. And I'm like, which one is that? Yeah. I, I like um, every time they would say that like someone's in trouble. I would just be like, okay, I don't know who that is. I'm gonna wait until the scene where they actually have that guy there and he's in trouble, and then I go, it's that guy they're talking about. Because at the end, I was like, I don't know who Taylor is. I don't know who Tinker is. I don't know who the spy is. I don't know. I don't know who any of these guys at are. The, <laughs> at the beginning, truthfully, what I did was I pulled up Wikipedia and I had like the cast list. Because then I could look at the cast list and they said Percy and it'd be like, okay, that's Toby Jones. And that's sort of how I worked through the first 20 to 30 minutes of the movie. Um, I should have done the same thing. I should have once that cheat sheet out. Yeah. But once that's uh, <laughs> settled, um, yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, a solid movie. I think it's like the twists and turns are very well done. And, uh, you know, it's an engaging mystery. Um I think, uh, yeah, I liked it more than other Le Car adaptations I've seen, and I liked some of them fairly well. Um, I think it's really well and dynamically shot. Um, like, it's interesting. Like, um, I really, so I was a big fan when it first came out of I Let the Right One In, the movie this director made prior to this. Uh, I still enjoyed that. I think that's a strong movie. I haven't seen the snowman, but man, I've never seen a career downturn so hard and immediate. Like he's just never come back from it in any meaningful way. But uh, I don't know. In these first two yeah. films, he showed a lot of skill. So well, I was I, I was pulling for him for Smiley's people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's one of those. I was things, pulling for like... him for Smiley's people because I think it's. Go ahead. I I just. I I I'm I'm glad it was a European director doing this story. Um I I think most American directors are probably too far removed from the history of this to really understand the anxiety of it and considering you know like I I think it's just they have a more unique worldview on how to communicate that kind of subterfuge in a way that I don't think we really quite understand um, that at least I haven't seen it really done well in the States in, in some time. Um, like, it, you know, it's mostly TV shows like the big ones are Homeland and the Americans. And even those like the, the Americans takes place in the eighties. So like even that sort of, it, it, it's a bit different, you know, like it, I think that having a Europeans point of view for this movie, I think led it itself well to the overall aesthetic of it I, i'd say um and like i said if you guys thought that the, the in, in the in the miniseries literally tinker taylor soldier beggar man like esther house bland hayden they all look alike they're all like i when i first watched it i watched the miniseries before i read the book and i had no idea who these fucking people were like even when they when they showed up and were talking to them i had no idea i knew ian richardson played bill hayden and that was it i had no idea i i knew two names smiley and control but that was it um, um and yeah so i at least this one had a, a decent enough cast a more recognizable cast at least in my sensibility in the aughts that uh it was easier to point out uh i think um so something i should say is like to elaborate on my uh you know uh the first question is obviously is uh Lucari for you um and i'd say an example of that being completely not true is uh, when I told Shannon this was the movie, she was like, yeah, watch that on your own. Um, because uh, I okay. think like, so, you know, this is a very, this is like um, a logical guys talking to the degree there are emotions. You hide your emotions as best as possible. Um, women can barely exist film. Yeah. It, it's almost and, a no play. <laughs> yeah. It's like there's weird rules when watching it that you have to be willing to fall into that cycle and in that mindset to enjoy it. But yeah, it's like an Agatha Christie. It's like you have to want an Agatha Christie to get enjoyment out of it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think Shannon generally, with the exception of 12 Angry Men and the thing, she needs a pretty meaty female role in there, at least somewhere. <laughs> Hard to find in the early 70s, La Carre. It gets better later yeah. on, but it, yeah, it, it, this one too, especially because there are maybe three women. Uh, one of them's a victim, the other one's uh, a faithless wife. And the others more of the matronly Sovietologist. Sovietologist, and Anne really so, not great. And um, Anne is a device in this movie. Like she, you never see her face. She has no lines. Like that is not. True. She never is an. Her in the book she either. is an object in relation to Smiley, and a bit of a device mm-hmm. for like the plot. But a character is being generous. Yeah, there, uh, you, right. And again, it it's, it's a little bit more it clear. Was a the lightly book written. It's all through prose. I think it makes sense that it's a lightly written character because this book and uh, I'm assuming the book and definitely the movie seems very much uh, in the world of just like what's happening at the office, like what his job is. Um, so I think having room in there for a relationship is probably more than the movie yeah. would be able to handle. But, John Le Carre's famous yeah. Michael Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> Though control does seem like a horrible boss, um, I but like it, it, it Percy doesn't seem much better. Um, Smiley seems even worse. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I, I think that that's absolutely fair, um, especially because you know the other adaptation, I think pretty successful adaptation is a radio play they did uh, a few years ago. Um, Simon Russell Beale plays Smiley. Um, and that rocks too. And they, the way that works is like, Anne's more or less like a ghost to Smiley. And so there's all this like dialogue back and forth between them that's in the book, but it's told in sort of memory and expository information. So it's hard to convey visually. I thought for being what Anne needed to be, again, this is a down to the studs adaptation. I think that that's fine. It's she's more like a ghost. She's a figment. She it's like Carla. You never see Carla either. Um, unlike in the miniseries and even in the book, they play out the whole meeting of Carla and Smiley in India. And I love the way this movie did it in particular, where he's just talking to an empty chair. Um, I think that that rocks um, because it's Smiley chasing ghosts. You know, yeah. I mean that that's it, it's so and I, I assume mean, if they had Lacari continued you, with the sequel probably, like they would probably get to in a the point 70s where... there's probably some well even with the sequel cuz Anne keeps is a prominent character in Smiley's world in the Carla trilogy especially in the third one cuz she actually does show up and mm-hmm. has to like sort of answer for the whole Bill Hayden because another thing that they don't mention in the movie that's true in the book is Bill Hayden and Anne Smiley are cousins. Oh. Oh, that's uh, that's more yeah. <laughs> distant, but you know, yeah, distant, but yeah, wow. still. Anyway, well, it's uh, very that's very English sort of, of them. Bill Hayden's whole character. <laughs> yeah, Bill Hayden's whole character is he does come from like, the upper crust level of society, um, and knew he wasn't going to amount to anything in that society. So he's it, you could tell. When you're reading Le Carre, because it should be said that Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy is more or less sort of uh, more or less inspired by true events that happened um, by a actual British mole named Kim Philby um, and like Le Carre, who actually was a spy. It should be said that the, the author did actually do this shit. Um, so, you know, and wrote Spy Who Came of the Cold while he was still an active serviceman another uh, uh sort of ian so, fleming parallel i guess but uh yeah sure sure though uh yeah. um fleming's a lot more of an exciting writer though in my opinion well he 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 his he has much more fantastical stories <laughs> that are less based sure. in the real world but still like there's still but there's still like you know probably more and and a lot of like especially more racist and misogynist as well, but uh. ha! well, let's not let's not go. Well, you know, let's not give Lacare too much of a. But you know, anyway, uh, you know, so he really it's because it's weird for Lacare because like when you when you read his books and you watch his movies, you don't get the sense that he's like a hardcore patriot, right? You know, you don't get the sense that he's all like God and country and shit. Um, but yet his utter loathing and 
like spite that he has for Kim Philby is very much translated into Bill Hayden. Um, the way that he writes Bill Hayden and the way that Bill Hayden is, there's this there's this real hatred that he has. And it's kind of a weird dichotomy for a guy like Le Carre, who is, again, not the most rah-rah country guy. But I think it's just like fairness to the game, maybe. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know yeah, who the... Yeah, who was Kim the Philby Kim was, you just referenced? Well, Kim he was a real-life spy. He... Real life, real life double agent. You know, Soviets recruited him. He was hmm. given away the crown jewels. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's why Le Carre. He, uh, you, this was him venting about that. Basically, this was a, an emotional response to what happened. He he says he never met Philby, but he knew a lot of the people who went down because of Philby. Um, like because there was more than one. It was a whole network. Um, so yeah and and even if you because before he died you know he kept writing and they even asked him you know this was because he died in 2020 right before the pandemic um but before the ukraine evasion but still you know putin and so he said like it's kind of different but kind of the same now right with like putin and stuff he said i think it's gone exactly where it used to be we're back to old war spycraft basically you write things down on paper you know, yeah, it's Moscow rules, you know, like it's it's we've gone backwards and you could tell he's not happy about it. Like he's kind of pissed um, because this is I mean, like everybody said he was washed up after the Cold War ended, you know, because this is what he was known for was like the Cold War sort of narration and kind of bringing this notion of spy trading and spies into flesh and blood almost because it was a massively successful at least the spy who came for the cold was which was like 1964 or something um and this one was really popular too but then the cold war you know when the wall fell like everybody said oh le carré what are you gonna do well then he just found you know he said there's always gonna be powerful people with agendas who will use suckers like me to get what they want um and that will never change. So he's a real, real cheery guy, you know, right? All these books are really, really, really yeah. uplifting. And, you know, you feel really good about yourself and the world around you. The um, Tomorrow's the a beautiful day. <laughs> <laughs> what, one of the things with this adaptation that kind of hit me is funny. And I don't know if it's because I knew it was a TV show originally, but watching it, I kept getting the sense of TV show um from parts of it and that isn't to say it wasn't cinematic it was just that i got mm. this sense of like the music for example uh sort of a weird jazz riff throughout the whole thing felt to me like a bbc tv show um the other thing i noticed with cinematography is they used a lot of <laughs> zooms they would do like a lot of dollies and zooms which i always have kind of uh, associated with mm -hmm. uh any of those things where they would have to shoot them in a like a building space at the time where they would just zoom the camera in to kind of give it some more um, sort of business, uh, more stuff happening with the camera, moving it around so it wasn't just people sitting s static in a room. Um, but yeah, the uh, it was strange because it's not a long movie, but it does, and it has a lot of stuff happening, but it still seems like it has kind of a calm, almost laconic pace for a great deal of it. Um, like there isn't really big, intense, dramatic moments that, uh, end with her hysteronics or anything like that. It's just, this is what's happening. Like, even when the guy gets shot at the end, he just sort of like, there's no like shooting and then falling back dramatically. He just sort of closes his eyes and falls over, which I, I was like, it's interesting. It's interesting how they handled, uh, violence in this yeah. movie and all of that, because it seems like even... That stuff was sort of done in a, a but, polite yeah, I suppose fashion. That's also yeah. I'll give you a bit. I'll give don't give Chris a point for for the observation about violence. I guess because um, I think that that echoes with the Irina death, which is a little bit more surprising because it happens suddenly, but it is not underscored by like a big sting or anything like that. It just kind of happens. And she's instantly dead. There, you know, she just kind of falls over. Um, even the way um, I think it portrays 
the torture of Mark Strong's character is very reserved. Like we see him sitting in that chair and that intermittent sound cutting in and out. And it's not a graphic depiction of torture, but I think it's a, you know, you understand like this is a prolonged sort of uh, sensory torture that they've been giving this guy for, for a considerable amount of time. I'm, without any I'm blood on screen underline that right uh, and i'm gonna underline that scene too because i think that's a good point but i think what's another crucial aspect that i think is the heart of the le carré world is while that's happening there's just a woman there that's reading the paper you know she's just like doing the crossword just like while this guy's just being tortured that's the banality of this shit that I think like is so crucial to Le Carre. I, I just love that scene because the woman just sit there just like reading the paper while this guy's clearly just like listening to like howler monkeys or whatever for hours on end. Um, you know, yeah. like it, it, it's there's crazy. Scene, and, and there's a scene like that in Brazil. They too, change a lot really of the well. violence from the book. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's so true um the violence in the in the book's a lot more um big for example okay so jim preto killing bill hayden is more or less ambiguous you kind of have to dig through it to figure out you find that bill hayden's been killed but doesn't exactly spell out that jim preto i think he just snaps his neck actually um but uh, but that's done off. You don't see it happening. The only other one that you really get the wrong, strong sense of violence is is Jim Prido's capture. And it doesn't go down like it does in, in this show. First of all, it takes place in Czechoslovakia, not in Hungary. But whatever. Eastern Europe block. Same, you know, whatever. They, they got the shooting permit in Hungary. So go for it. Um, so, but the, he actually is ambushed by, like, the army, by, like, the, the Russian army. Um and like there's a huge shootout and everything it's it's a lot more dramatic um so it's a lot more obvious and that's why it's kind of a bigger deal that it happened because it made such a big splash this one i thought was better just like having a random victim again you know really great with the women that a woman's just there just to get shot um so and you really never know what happens with arena but i mean smiley basically tells ricky tar she's dead bro she she's not coming back they have her she's not coming back um yeah so yeah it this movie while changing the violent aspects in the story kept true to the actual spirit of what i think le Carre is trying to do with with whenever it does get violent in le Carre. and when it does yeah. it's usually like an army and shit a battle i mean the the two guys who are killed when they capture arena are fairly graphic i guess their corpses yeah, I should but say. it's like after the fact mm. right you yeah it's not the, their deaths are not screen you just see them um, afterwards so right yeah i think the, the you only see the two the arena and um and and bill hayden which is i think it's crucial to inspire came from the cold because like they, i think it's crucial to realize which they changed in the movie that the only two people who are killed in that are the two jewish people while the british intelligence is trying to protect an ex-nazi um so anyway yeah anyway le Carre is a weird guy because again you could tell he doesn't really care for the whole empire business but really really hates kim philby for like betraying the service or whatever i just think it's fucking interesting but i think the spy genre in general you know like it, it, i think bond is king bond is always going to be king um it that's just the nature of it um but i've always been an affinity for the lacare stuff just because i like the banality of it and that and, and even especially with the smiley books the it's it's almost like a fantasy book right like there's all these lingo that they use and this mythos that goes behind it and the origin of control and where did carla come from you know like there's it's all in there in the books um and that's why i think most people hate le carre adaptations because it it basically just dips it into acid and just brings out its bleached bones and calls it a movie which is what happened with the diane keaton little drummer girl movie um i think that this one did the same process basically of just kind of deep frying it as best as they could while maintaining the flavor and the the 11 spices and shit you know like i think that that's fucking well done 
Um, and it should be said that one of the screenwriters passed away after doing this movie too, which is a bummer because this is really, really good adaptation with not easy source material. That's sort of why I picked this movie to kind of go up against like something like Shawshank or Pontypool because I think both Shawshank and Pontypool, both of those movies expand bigger than the source material allows. Like this one had to do your typical job of adaptations where you have to scale back quite a bit um, to make it work in a two hour snackable form yeah one uh actually just to add to what you just said the two writers um uh one of them was uh bridget o'connor and peter strahan peter uh, they were married uh i guess bridget o'connor was the one who passed away unfortunately but yeah they were actually a married yeah, they couple. dedicated the movie to her that's about right. They were nominated for an Oscar. I thought it should have won. It, it lost to the George Clooney Descendants movie, but whatever. Um, I don't even remember. For an sentence. adapted screenplay. Because I thought this is... Yeah, I don't either, right? That's what I'm saying. Like, and this is one of my favorite I movies. remember that award. That was the award that Jim Rash this won. Movie. Uh, from uh, uh, Community. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, That's right, yeah. I think yeah. a lot of this talk is feeling a little Final Thoughtsy to me. Am I getting yeah. the right vibe on that? Sure. Yeah, I think I'm I'm about there. Yeah, I think that's a fair enough vibe. Yeah. Um, oh, I, before we go, I did. I do got to give credit to the side performances too. Like not just Smiley J Gary Oldman, but I I give a lot of credit to like Benedict Cumberbatch, John Hurt, Colin Firth certainly as Bill Hayden. Like they're the they're the casting of the side characters give a lot of the dimension that the book outright tells you and this what the movie only gets to imply but because they nailed it with the casting you you get the dynamic pretty quick pretty clearly uh That's yeah it. i think <laughs> i guess they do uh, i was gonna say, i guess i say uh briefly before we do the final thoughts also in terms of a mystery i think it does a decent job uh, of keeping each person in contention who they set up as a likely suspect obviously they have like the the named you know suspects uh with the exception of smiley who we pretty much know is is not uh at fault but you know uh i think um it seemed plausible to me that like uh the percy character who seemed the most openly sort of antagonistic could be like the hidden in plain sight correct answer hayden seemed to have a lot to do so it seemed po probable there would be him and even the kieran hines character who was so in the background for most of it that the twist that he was kind of keeping quiet and doing this machinations like i felt it all all seemed somewhat plausible to me so i think they did a good job of uh of keeping the mystery afloat and keeping every character feeling like a potential the potential uh uh spy titular spy uh i remember seeing this one back when it came out i thought it was really good at the time um, I think I watched it assuming that they would do like a series of these movies, but they only did the one. Um, it's, it's good. Um, uh, I don't know if, uh, it's like the, the craziest, uh, spy movie I've seen, but, um, you know, for what it is, it, it definitely did get the job done. And, um, yeah, I, uh, I enjoyed it. I'd give it like a solid eight out of, out of 10 uh anyway um so yeah i i i think uh, i kind of largely said my piece like um this is you know if you if uh if um uh a slow kind of um uh methodical uh slowly unraveling plot uh, with like a lot of dialogue and not like even at the big big moments like there's not a lot of intense emotion or feeling or like uh intense like high-end intensity in this so like if that's something that you feel you uh can enjoy or is your thing i think this is probably about as good as it's gonna get for that um which is a compliment because it's very difficult to make something like that engaging um even to people who like it i think uh it's very easy to make it just kind of dull and plotting and i think this uh does an admirable job of avoiding that uh through strong performances good set design good cinematography good blocking good script 
uh, that uh, apparently tears away a lot of the fluff um, uh, and extremely, you know, of the three, I don't know, like uh, Shawshank and, and Tinker, I think, are both really successful adaptations. Pontypool sounds like it's so different, it's almost hard to judge um the comparison from between the book and the and the movie um so uh yeah uh definitely enjoyed good movie um that's yeah that's about it <laughs> all right uh yeah mine's real quick because i think i've gushed about this movie enough um it's uh yeah it's you know considering the re- the reducing they had to do to make this story into a digestible form uh, while not losing the temperature that the book is trying to set, which as Zach and you guys have noted is lukewarm. You know, it's a, you know, everyone's real polite. Everyone just sits down for tea and there's rules to the game. And yeah, it's, it is that story. And the thrilling aspects of it are the piecing together the mysteries. Um, I've seen this movie a couple of times and I've read the book at least three times. I reread it for this. Um, and it, it's striking to me how non emotive our main character is George Smiley. The guy is an emotional black hole. He thinks about Anne a lot he's upset about Anne and Bill Hayden but not because of the lack of faith it's because she wasn't allowed to do that with somebody who's also in the service he also wasn't nuts that they were cousins Um, so that's it for George so this movie even gives George Smiley a bit of a catharsis in his confrontation with bill at the end when he says well i'm not carla's bloody office boy and george smiley the only the only time the temperature raises with him is that well what are you then bill that is not in the book um it's so this movie even is a little bit kinder to george than le carre is um by allowing him to have at least a modicum of emotional outburst, which he is not doing and doesn't do throughout his life, basically. Um, So well fucking done, you know, considering that if you're going to be a pure, I mean, like the most people who even look here, fans, I I think Zach's right. They put this as far as the top of adaptations. I think they'd probably put spy. came from the cold a little bit, probably get the edge. Um, even though they changed the the main character to not be Jewish. Um, So uh, I think that that being said, this is about as close as it can get. And I think it's useful to do it, uh, you know, almost 40 years later, you know, from the seventies, you know, we have a little bit more hindsight and we have a little bit more of a grasp of the absurdity of all of it, you know, so having the kind of mundane moments that this movie does so good at doing uh, lends a little bit more firepower to it. And I think that uh, if it resonated at all with culture and it must have, because it was nominated for shit, not that that means anything, but it got nominated. Um, So uh, yeah, well done. Uh, So thanks for letting me do that. Yeah. And as far as again, I I mentioned it earlier, but as far as like Pontypool and, and Shawshank Pontypool seems like it's, they found a nugget in the book and expanded on it. And in Shawshank's case, they had a short story that was told through a long period of time and through very great script writing, <laughs> they managed to condense it into also a snackable form. No, so they expanded. I don't they they expanded on they expanded on the win. short story in, in Shawshank. There, there's more to the movie than there is in the short story. Right. Um, sure. So it's the opposite of this um, in some ways. Yeah. So um, where it's, this is the opposite. This is this is a, a cold reduction. So, um, yeah. With that in mind, um, in and I guess I'll just for I the for the end uh, before we conclude, uh, I'll give Russell a point for uh, rereading the book and giving us some insights into the difference between. Oh, great! Just you know give what, some Zach, last in that spirit. I even wrote it down, but I forgot to 
I even wrote it down, but I forgot to mention it. I was going to give you a point as well to rightly point out the bad use of women in uh, oh, Sarah sure. and Carey, and especially this book. Um, so you get a point for that. So uh, great, that's fun. I got extra credit for doing homework. Yay! Um, okay, so that brings us to voting, where we get to pick the next theme. So just to reiterate, uh, Chris Borath, you have fourteen points for final voting. I have 12 points for final voting. And Zach, you have 12 points for final voting. Um, so with that in mind, we now get to move on. So take, take your moment. Do your math if you got to. All right, are we ready? Yeah. Yes. All righty. All righty. So, Chris Boroff, what have you got for Shawshank Redemption? Um, I had to do this because of math. Um, I really do like Shawshank Redemption, but I'm giving it a four. And there's a small hammer. Okay, a little rock hammer. And yeah, there you go. Nice touch. Um, I'm giving Shawshank Redemption a five. Uh, I also... What were the four on my particular answer there? All right. So that is Shawshank with 13. Uh, so that brings us to uh, Chris Boroff. What have you got for Pontypool? All right. For Pontypool, I went with a six. And that's a small ear. Um. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I gave Pontypool a three, and that's mainly because of math. Um, but I, I did enjoy that movie quite a bit. Uh, I gave Pontypool also a four. All right. Okay, so that brings us to Tinker Taylor. Uh, Chris Boroff, what have you got for Tinker Taylor? Uh, That's 13 I, points, so you guys are tied right now. <laughs> I gave Tinker Taylor a four. And that would be the smiley. Because okay. uh, he surprisingly doesn't <laughs> smile ever. Because he's so smiley and happy. <laughs> uh, I gave Tinker Taylor a four as well. I also gave Tinker Taylor a four. I gave everything a four. Essentially making my votes useless. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah so that's uh yeah that brings me so i get to decide who wins yeah because that is 13 points for shawshank 13 points for pontypool and 12 points for uh tinker taylor pretty close guys this is not bad um all right so in the era of a tiebreaker since i'm out i get to pick the winner and um you know zach i gotta give it to boref on this one I think this has been like your second theme, including the Halloween one. I think it's time to hand the reins over. Uh, sure. So I think in my heart sure. of hearts, Shawshank probably is better than Pontypool, but because Borif got the, the writer on board, he did the, the extra interview. It's his favorite movie. Let's give it to Borif. Come on, let's give it to him. <laughs> so congratulations, Chris Borif. You now get to pick the next theme that you will trap us in with your movies. So... Chris Boroff, what on earth are we doing? Okay, um, so uh, coming up with the theme was a little challenging, um, but something happened this last week where uh, I just kept having the same movie suggested to me again and again and again, so I've decided uh, the movie's going to be Significant Other, which is a sci-fi horror film that's on Paramount+. Plus. Uh, it has gotten really good word of mouth. It's mostly just that it is a horror film that I have been told multiple times by multiple people in the last week that I need to see. So the theme in this case 
would be um, horror films that you have heard a lot about that you have never actually seen. Uh, so this would be an idea for oh all boy, of us to one for me. to pick something new, something you haven't seen. Okay. Uh, random choice. All right. Sounds good. Movies. Yeah, it's going to be tougher for Zach, because I get recommended horror movies all the time, and I never see them, so I've got a long list. Um, cool. Well, that should be easy and fun. Um, okay, well, uh, we can go ahead and wrap up this rather long episode. We got done with our voting, and we are on to the next theme with Chris Borf. Tune in next time. What year did that come out, Borf? Significant other. Uh, 2021. This came out last year on Paramount+. Okay, Plus, pretty recent. And it just Two years ago. disappeared. Yeah. No, no, it's a 2022 here, October 7th, 2022. Yep. Okay. Last year, close enough. All right, great. So tune in for that next time where we'll be starting a brand new theme of horror movies that have been recommended to us that we have yet to see. So it'll be new for everybody. Uh, it'll be a batch of virgins for us. So good for us. Um, okay. So with that in mind, thank you so much for joining us, being patient with the uh, hiatuses and whatnot, but we're always chugging away. Don't give up on us. We will always be back. Uh, with that being said, I have been Russell Carlson and I have been joined by Chris Boroff. Uh Keep smiling, truckers. <laughs> <laughs> Assume that's a scene in the movie. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> and I've also been joined by Zach Powers. Uh, hitting an owl with the newspaper while it's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's some action and violence for you. Riveting yeah. stuff. Okay, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And as we always see her on the movie trap, Diane Ladd is too young to play Chevy Chase's mom. Uh, it's the movie trap promise. It's the movie trap promise. I had to pick a side, George. It was an aesthetic choice as much as a moral one. And the West has become so very ugly. Don't you think? Did Carla ever consider having you take over the circus? I'm not his bloody office boy. What are you then, Bill? <laughs>